She's the White House Associate Director of Public Engagement and Disability Liaison. She is our person in the White House, Karen McKenzie Williams. I'm glad to be the man, uh, or woman, as the case is, uh, in the White House. Ari suggested that in his invitation that I talk to you about the administration's priorities and agenda, uh, and I will. Second, uh, but first, I hope that you will allow me to take a little bit of a detour to talk about something else, and that is our community. There are so many organizations that comprise what we think of as a disability community, but perhaps none are more important than self-advocates. In a world where power and influence are often determined by financial resources and other forms of institutional privilege, ASUN has since its founding demonstrated the extraordinary impact that one small organization can have against deeply entrenched ways of doing business. I don't say that with surprise, because in many ways, that is the story of the disability community. I don't say it's a pander, uh, because I know you all know what you're capable of, and you don't need me up here to affirm it. I say it because as someone who works in the Office of Public Engagement, I have the opportunity to meet with many members of our community. Sometimes I meet with large teams, sometimes I meet with just one or two folks, sometimes I meet with individuals with decades of experience in and out of various administrations, and sometimes I meet with folks with one to two years of college and unmatched convictions and commitment. In the White House, with the leadership of President Obama, all of those voices matter. And it's important to me that you know that the administration respects your work and your point of view. Self-advocates are and will continue to be heard. Embedded in the values of our president and this administration is a deep understanding of the continuing gaps between our legislative promises and regulatory reality. We know that for far too many Americans, there is a wide gap between the dreams they have and the realities that they confront in their daily life. Nearly six years ago, President Obama gave a speech that characterized the reality that I believe we face as a disability community with the 25th anniversary of the ADA on the horizon. In his famous speech on race relations, the President said, what would be needed were Americans in successive generations who were willing to do their part. Through protest and struggle, I see Jackson on the side, uh, on the streets and in the courts, through civil disobedience and always at great risk, to narrow that gap between the promise of our ideals and the reality of their time. We could easily, easily pin those words about the many civil rights battles in our history, and it is true of the disability rights movement as we continue the work to achieve the goals articulated in the ADA. The quality of opportunity and full participation in community life will come from the efforts of those like all of you who are willing to disrupt the complacency and the status quo of the systems and attitudes that enable a continued second-class status for people with disabilities. At the risk of being cliche, I hope you forgive me this, but I believe that you are the core of our community. Change is going to come from you, and one of the first two messages that I want to share is to not stop what you're doing. Continue to fight for a better future for people with disabilities. You'll forgive me for chuckling this, Mr. Jackson. <laughs> I've known him since he was in the womb. The second message is that we stand with you as the administration. 
We have come a long way in the last 25 years, but know that there is a great amount of work to be done. We are focusing our efforts in some key areas, employment, education, and community living. Rather than being a new effort, what you will continue to see from us is a steady march towards improved outcomes. In employment, which we started a while back in 2010, the president issued an executive order to make the federal government a model employer for people with disabilities. That order requires new hiring plans, establish new accountability measures, and set a goal of hiring 100,000 persons with disabilities into the federal workforce. That effort has resulted in change with more people with disabilities being hired than any time in the past 32 years. And that includes individuals with targeted disabilities. Our March board has included new regulations. Early this year, the Department of Labor finalized new rules under Section 503. These rules, as you know, require federal contractors and subcontractors to have a utilization rate of 7%. 7% of their workforces must be people with disabilities. My friends over at the Department of Labor, Patricia Shu, Claudia Gordon, and the capable team at the Office of Federal Contractor Compliance Programs, which does not roll off the tongue, spend a majority of their time working with the community and with employers to ensure that they have the resources and tools they need to recruit, hire, retain, and promote qualified people with disabilities. We know that setting these standards will create change. We're not simply interested in enforcing new rules, but are working very hard to provide businesses with the resources and technical assistance that they need to hire qualified people with disabilities. Our approach is not one-sided. He's in rat. He's really paying attention. We know that creating a demand for employees puts pressure on our schools and workforce development system to bolster the pipeline of talent ready to fill new careers. Before he signed WIOA into law, the president had already charged Vice President Biden with reviewing our job training system. That review and the partnerships it spurred formed the backdrop in which we've embarked on developing new regulations for the law. And that law, one that set competitive integrated employment as a goal for disabilities, is a primary focus of our administration in the coming years. I'm a little bit concerned as he walks away. <laughs> <laughs> we are pairing that focus with the emphasis on of education and transition. And you all know I have come to this work by way of the youth team at the Office of Disability Employment Policy. I strongly believe that there are things that all youth must have, including academic preparation, work-based learning experiences, youth development and leadership experiences in order to successfully transition. The efforts being undertaken by the Department of Education, something you heard just now from Melody, are a clear indication of the priority that the White House and the administration place on improving academic preparation and transition services for youth. Our commitment extends to community living as well. In Sharon Lewis and the leadership at the Administration for Community Living, you see the goals for our community being operationalized in a complex bureaucracy. It is no easy job to redefine how an industry does business and how services are delivered, but I assure you that we are committed to the work and to making certain that Olmstead is vigorously enforced. And I look at you because I say that. We are marching forward in all of these areas, in employment, in education, in community living, and we will continue to do so as we come to the 25th anniversary of the ADA. In that anniversary, we see an opportunity to reflect on the history and culture of our community and to reaffirm the commitment this country made to a new way of life for people with disabilities. We have no intention of stopping until we get there, and my final message to you is that you stay with us on this journey, continuing to poke, prod, push, and collaborate towards that future that we all envision. Thank you.